the underground Christian network. We begin our study today on the subject of Scientology. This is, of course, one of the most rapidly growing of all non-Christian cults in the United States. I personally believe that it is both cultic and occultic. And in order to justify that, let me define both terms in context. Cultism, generally speaking, is descriptive of a group of individuals gathered around somebody's interpretation of the Bible. It claims generally to be in harmony with Christianity, but almost always ends up by denying the central doctrine of the Christian faith, namely that Jesus Christ is incarnate deity. Occultism is derived from the Latin word occultus, which means secret or hidden things. And the Church of Scientology, uh, I believe, fits both of these. Gathered as it is around the teachings of L. Ron Hubbard, who set forth his basic ideas in a book published in 1950 entitled Dianetics, it has today grown to a reputed membership of 600,000 and surely a peripheral membership of well over one million. Christianity Today gave a brief summation of this, and I thought that it really summed it up in meaningful terms when the author said that after five years of naval service during World War II, Hubbard, founder of Scientology, became critically ill, crippled, blind, and twice declared dead by doctors. He rebounded to perfect health, he says, by applying the principles later described in his book Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health. This 435-page volume, the culmination of years of research, was written in the space of 60 days and sold 100,000 copies within three months of its publication in 1950. Its eclectic sources include, says Hubbard in the book, quote, the medicine man of the Goldie people of Manchuria, the shamans of North Borneo, Sioux medicine men, the cults of Los Angeles, modern psychology, Jung, Adler, Freud, Pavlov, a magician whose ancestors served in the court of Kublai Khan, and a Hindu who could hypnotize cats, close quote. Time magazine, describing this in August 1968, said that the philosophy of Scientology is, quote, billed as a sort of religion of religions, combining parts of Hindu Veda, Dharma, Taoism, Old Testament wisdom, Buddhist principles of brotherly love and compassion, the early Greeks, Lucretius, Spinoza, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, Spencer, and Freud. Close quote. I would think with all of these things having been set forth that we would have ample evidence that L. Ron Hubbard has at least tried to cover the whole field of philosophy and religion and then to spray it with a veneer of psychology in a way that will appeal to the average person who is trying to find instant solutions to extremely complex problems. On the subject of Hubbard himself, originally it was represented by Scientology that Hubbard was a highly educated man. The truth of the matter is that he is not a highly educated or qualified psychologist or psychiatrist. He does not have a degree in this field, a doctor's degree in this field. And his particular work, Dianetics, was roundly condemned by virtually all psychiatric and psychological authorities from the orthodox schools of study. Uh, in the analysis of uh, Dianetics, which became Scientology in 1955, primarily because Hubbard had stirred up such a hornet's nest on the subject that it became necessary to cloak Dianetics and his particular beliefs with religion in order to continue uh, an effective operation. And that is exactly what he did. Now, as you go and read the vast amount of literature on the subject, you will notice that Scientology uh, has accurately been described as a pseudo-scientific cultic structure. And one of the evaluations of Scientology, which I find to be very accurate after analyzing a great deal of information on it, is that contained in today's health in an article by Ralph Lee Smith, who wrote, quote, Couched in pseudo-scientific terms and rights, this dangerous cult claims to help mentally or emotionally disturbed persons 
for sizable fees. Scientology has grown into a very profitable worldwide enterprise and a serious threat to health. Scientology is a cult which thrives on glowing promises that are heady stuff for the lonely, the weak, the confused, the ineffectual, and the mentally or emotionally ill. Close quote. Now, L. Ron Hubbard in 1966 received $240,000 in fees from Scientology, and he forgave the organization a $13 million debt, quote, for services rendered. Close quote. Time magazine pointed out that this was, quote, an understandable act of charity, considering that he has boasted to friends of having seven million dollars stashed away in two numbered Swiss bank accounts. Close quote. In other words, Scientology has, in a way, provided very well for its founder, L. Ron Hubbard. And the people who go into Scientology can spend as much as $15,000 passing through the various classes, attempting to attain what they call clear. The first clear was John McMaster. This individual claimed that he had finally attained an exalted state of being clear, emotionally clear and mentally clear, and removing all of the so-called engrams which are uh, impressed upon the human consciousness. I think perhaps in order to understand what an engram is, we might go to a former minister of the Church of Scientology who rose very high in the ranks and who did a monumental piece of research for Christian Research Institute from which I would like to quote at this particular time. He says, The theory of Scientology is based on the engram. Hubbard says that there are two minds one conscious and one the reactive that record traumatic experiences kept out of the other banks, apparently memory banks, as in computers, but which in times of stress can affect and control the organism. He considers mental content to be primarily mental image pictures taken by the Thetan, his term for the being, a roughly spirit-soul combination as it moves along in time. This and pain and the entire content of the incident. He considers mental content to be primarily mental image pictures taken by the Thetan. His term for the being, a roughly spirit-soul combination as it moves along in time. This is the time track. Engrams are recordings of moments of unconsciousness and pain and the entire content of the incident. They are the cause of all psychosomatic illnesses and personality aberrations. Remove the aberrative engram and the aberration vanishes. They occur in chains of related incidents through time. They are handled in Dianetic auditing. Auditor and pre-clear sit across from each other on a table. The auditor faces a small meter and the PC holding two electrodes. That's the pre-clear. The meter is used to help determine specific phenomena objectively. Uh, One training drill, the coach makes up a date up to tens of trillions of years ago, and the trainee, by meter alone and by asking rhetorical questions, uh, they get into a dialogue and they start asking questions about this. And this particular type of dialogue is supposed to yield information which penetrates and which reveals these things. Now, Scientology takes off, he says, from a completed Dianetics case, and the ultimate goal of Scientology is operating Phaeton Section 8, total power over matter, energy, space, time, life, and thought. Notice that they use a code name for this, or MEST, M-E-S-T. By removing charge from the case in certain defined steps along a gradient, this is to be done. Auditing is for the most part not unlike Dianetic auditing, being repetitive use of one of a series of questions directing attention to a certain area. This particular minister, incidentally, who did this research is an X class 8, X C org, that means uh, organization member, ex-minister of Scientology, ex-human and currently alive in Jesus Christ. 
I think that we have some insight into what is going on, namely the use of the E-meter and the use of the auditor. The E-meter, of course, is a simple galvanic device which the Federal Drug Administration didn't take kindly to. And I have a picture of it here. And uh, the individual sits opposite the auditor and uh, takes hold of uh, two cans which are hooked to this particular uh, meter. And then the readings from this galvanometer, uh, which is similar to a lie detector, is used in the practice of auditing and is supposed to give readings that help the individual analyze what is going on in the person's mind. Now, there's a whole vocabulary connected with Scientology. And I'm going to review some of that vocabulary, but let me first of all point out that Scientology capitalizes exactly on what the article in Today's Health says. It ca categorically capitalizes on people who are lonely and weak and confused, ineffectual and mentally and emotionally ill, who are looking for instant solutions to all these great problems. You know, one of the things that plagues us in our day of the advancement of science and technology is that living in a technocratic society, an advanced society as we do, people believe that science has some kind of magic wand. And all you have to do is mention the word science and wave the wand and you have solved the problem. Now, if you think that I'm uh, stretching this, I suggest that you turn on your television set some night and just monitor the number of appearances on television commercials of people who are involved in research or who are attempting to sell you something on the basis of dental reports, doctor's reports, uh, analysis of aspirin, uh, of pain relievers, uh, of uh, tranquilizers without prescription. You will find science stamped on everything. And people today are looking for oversimplification. They want to have all their problems solved instantaneously. Well, Scientology is ready to do this for you. You can come in and pass through the stages. You can go through the e-meter. You can talk to somebody about your problems. You can disgorge all of these things. And as you move along, eventually you arrive at the state of being a clear. And here it says, your problems have been with you quite long enough. Registrars are waiting now to help you remove them. The Church of Scientology. We cannot any of us go on pretending all is well or that all will be well. It is not so. Unless we ourselves are audited, we will die as personal beings. Close quote. L. Ron Hubbard. Auditing. The application of Scientology techniques for personal betterment. In other words... Unless you go through this so that you are audited, you will die as a personal being. That's how important L. Ron Hubbard says Scientology is to you. It's strange how every cultic and occultic system inevitably gets around to telling you how important it is by threatening you with either eternal destruction or some form of mental, emotional, or spiritual disintegration. And so what you are dealing with is a system which is pseudo-scientific and pseudo-religious. It is really occultic because it is reaching beyond and attempting to latch on to powers, so to speak, that are really described in the scripture as being within the dimension of the forces of darkness. And what you're seeing is not scientific, as we're going to see when we get into the doctrines of Scientology. What you are seeing is theological aberration. That is, aberration away from the historic Christian message and the revelation of Holy Scripture. Now, what does it mean when they are talking about a clear? Well, to do uh, justice to it, we have to quote from the definitions provided by Scientology itself, and they have given us a whole list of definitions. What do we mean by some of these terms? Well, a clear is a thetan who has no reactive mind. Well, what is a reactive mind? That portion of a person's mind which works on a stimulus-response basis. 
given a certain stimulus, it gives a certain response. Well, what is a clear? A Satan who has no reactive mind. A clear is a being who has attained this state by completing the St. Hill Clearing Course and being declared clear by the St. Hill Qualifications Division. Now, if you understand how Hubbard has set this up, he has uh, headquarters in Australia and in England. He travels the world on a great boat. And uh, the British government has taken a rather dim view of Scientology. The United States government has taken a rather dim view. When the British, who are renowned for moving very slowly in areas like this, have denounced it as scientific quackery and have come down hard on Scientology wherever they possibly could, then I think it's time for people to start taking a good, hard look at what Mr. Hubbard is saying. And what really is he saying? He's saying that if you follow the procedures which he outlines, if you accept the premises that he lays down, if you will, by faith, accept him and his statement that unless we ourselves are audited by his methods, we will die as personal beings. But unless this is done, then a person can never, ever really understand their own souls, their own minds, and the problems that they are facing in life. Now, there are grade four release, grade three release, two release, one release, zero release, and there's Dianetic case completion, and then ARC straight wire release and life repair. You can see that it's an entirely structured system guaranteed, so to speak, to have you revitalized. This world will be revitalized and reborn. Our help is yours. Well, it is yours, but you pay for it, and you pay a considerable amount of money. Now, what actually is a Thetan? A Thetan is the person himself, not his body or name, the physical universe, his mind, or anything else, that which is aware of being aware, the identity that is the individual, from Theta, the Greek symbol for thought, or perhaps spirit. Well, the Greek symbol for spirit is not Theta. Uh, the word for spirit in Greek is noma, and uh, therefore uh, we can see that uh, the Scientology people have a limited background in the analysis of biblical terminology. Then there is the definition of Dianetics, which is through thought or mind, man's most advanced school of the mind, founded and developed by L. Ron Hubbard. Dianetics was the route from aberrated or aberrated and ill human to capable human. Scientology is the route from human being to total freedom and total beingness. Now, there are eight manifestations or dynamics which you pass through. The first dynamic, the urge towards survival of self. The second is the urge towards survival through sex or children. The third is the urge towards survival through a group of individuals or the group. The fourth dynamic is the urge towards survival through mankind as mankind. The fifth dynamic is the urge towards survival through life forms, animals, birds, insects, fish, vegetation. The sixth dynamic is the urge towards survival as the physical universe and has as its components matter, energy, space, and time. The seventh dynamic is the urge towards survival through spirits. Now, that's an important point. Through spirits or as a spirit. Anything spiritual with or without identity would come under the seventh dynamic. Please notice that. This is where we enter the world of the occult. The seventh dynamic is the urge towards survival through spirits or as a spirit. Anything spiritual with or without identity would come under the seventh dynamic. Can you imagine what you could get under that? The world is filled, the scripture says, with the forces of evil. And they are spiritual forces. That means that if the seventh dynamic is an urge towards survival through spirits or as a spirit, and anything spiritual with or without identity would come under this dynamic, then one could be possessed by devils under this dynamic. And there would be no objection to this, whatever, because you would be attempting solution through this dynamic. 
Here, of course, is oversimplification, once again, and a total ignorance of the dangers involved in the metaphysical without the guide of Scripture. What is uh, the eighth dynamic? Is the urge toward survival through a supreme being, or more exactly, through infinity? This is called the eighth dynamic because the symbol of infinity stood upright makes the numeral eight. Notice it's an urge toward survival through a supreme being or infinity. So you are not dealing with a personal God in Scientology. What you are dealing with is an impersonal force. We have seen in our studies of Zen Buddhism, of Hare Krishna, of Mir Baba, of the Eastern esoteric religions, and particularly of the world religions of Hinduism and Buddhism, that all of them share in common a pantheistic concept of God, an impersonal deity. This is also true of Scientology, for Scientology speaks of a supreme being, but not of a supreme person, certainly not the God of the Bible. A pre-clear is a person who, through Scientology processes, is finding out more about himself and life. And a process is a patterned action of unvarying steps done by an auditor and a pre-clear under the auditor's direction to release or free the pre-clear from his aberrations. What is Scientology? Quote, a religious philosophy dealing with the study of knowledge in its fullest sense, which, through the application of its technology, can bring about desirable changes in any condition. Scientology is the road to spiritual Freedom. Please note that. Scientology is the road to spiritual freedom. Now, whatever Scientology is, it is not a road to spiritual freedom. Because the only road to spiritual freedom, according to biblical theology, is that road that comes through a redemptive experience of the soul with the Lord Jesus Christ. Mr. Hubbard knows nothing of this. Scientology knows nothing of this. They use the Bible copiously. I have in front of me a book of some 50 pages. And here we have Mr. Hubbard's theology paralleled with passages of the Bible, compiled by his followers. And it makes fascinating reasoning and fascinating reading. For instance, I'd like to give you some illustrations of some of the things that we find in Mr. Hubbard's teaching. Quote, Truth is relative to environment, experience, and truth. Think about that. Truth is relative to environment, experience, and truth. Page 10. Now, if you go over to page 28, and if you go further, to other pages on this particular subject, page 27 also, you will find another statement from Hubbard. Truth is actually a relative quantity. It could be said to be the most reasonable existing data about any body of facts. So there is consistency. On the same page, page 27, you find this statement, axiom 38. Truth is the exact consideration Truth is the exact time, place, form, and event. Now, do you see what's happened? There has been a complete reversal. Truth is a relative quantity. It could be said to be the most reasonable existing data about any body of facts. You're told on page 10, truth is relative to environments, experience, and truth. But on page 27, you are told truth is the exact time, the exact place, the exact form, and the exact event. How is it possible for truth to be exact form, time, and event, and place, at the same time be relative? It is either absolute or it is relative, but it's not both. So once again, we are involved in the law of non-contradiction. That is how important it is. Scientology violates it out of hand. Mr. Hubbard says one thing on one page and another thing on another. I think that we can learn a lesson from this. 
if Scientology is this confused in its thinking processes about theology and truth, how much more confused it will be about the person of him who is absolute truth. On page 11 of the same pamphlet, Logic 12, the value of a datum or a field of data is modified by the viewpoint of the observer. Modified for whom? For whom is it modified? The value of a datum or a field of data is modified by the viewpoint of the observer. Is it modified for the observer? Is it modified for the people who are observing it with him? If we both see the sun in the sky and we both see a solar eclipse and we both observe the phenomena, the value of the data or the field of the data is modified by the viewpoint of the observer. What's modified? What changes? You see, the whole idea of Scientology is that the mind, in essence, is what organizes and arranges the structure of reality. And it becomes a purely subjective judgment about what we see. You may see one thing, I may see the other. Now, that may be true when we're reporting an accident case. That may be true when we're talking about whether George had a pink shirt on or a blue one on. But it is definitely not true when we are observing the same universal phenomena. Then it is not modified. The data is the same. What we are dealing with in Scientology is a confusion in the precept of observation. Now, Hubbard goes on with his things, uh, and I think we ought to follow some of them to their conclusion. He says, quote, Never withdraw allegiance once granted. Never withdraw allegiance once granted. But you know, the scripture says that unless you withdraw a primary allegiance in this life, you will be lost for all eternity. Every single person that comes into this world is under allegiance to sin. Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that whoever you yield yourself servants to obey, his servant you are? Whether sin unto death or righteousness unto life? It is the record of the whole human race from Adam till the present day that we have done what? Yielded our allegiance to what? Sin. And it has had dominion over us. We must change that allegiance. We must switch our allegiance from sin and from Satan to God. And that comes about by the gracious act of God's grace and through the ministry of God's Spirit so that we are reborn into his kingdom by faith in Jesus Christ. So, to argue that we should never withdraw allegiance once granted is suicidal. Because if we maintain our basic allegiance throughout our lives, we will lose our souls forever. The Bible tells us in Colossians 1 that we have abandoned our allegiance to the world and we have been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Now we no longer walk according to the prince of the powers of the air, that spirit that works in the children of disobedience. We walk in the light as he is in the light, Christ. And we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Then Mr. Hubbard says, Never fear to hurt another in a just cause. Never fear to hurt another in a just cause. This is not a Christian maxim. Certainly it is not a biblical teaching. For who is to determine what's the just cause? And the scripture says that we are not to hurt anybody. Instead, we are to turn the other cheek and we are to be willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. We're not supposed to hurt people, even in a just cause, so to speak. And I'm speaking within the framework of our social context today. Then, of course, comes one of the classic statements. Be your own advisor. Keep your own counsel, 
and select your own decisions. I don't know how many of you have your Bibles with you, but it'd be interesting to check out a biblical reference on that. The Lord Jesus Christ said that the wisest man that ever lived was Solomon. And Solomon said something in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, which we might parallel with what L. Ron Hubbard has said. Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 18. Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice we should make war. What are we being told? That every purpose is established how? By counsel. And even when you go out to go into warfare, said Solomon, what should you do? You had better have good advisors. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ said almost exactly the same thing? He said, no king goes out to war against another king unless he does what first? Checks up on the strength of his adversary so he knows whether or not he has a chance. So you do what? You have counsel. But you are told specifically here, don't at all be your own advisor. Excuse me, don't uh, at all, at any time, think that you can rely upon the counsel of others. Be your own advisor, keep your own counsel, and select your own decisions. If Christ was correct, and I'm sure he is from the light of the revelation of God, then we are certainly to take what he says most seriously. Now, it's possible to quote and quote and quote from the theology of Ron Hubbard and to see contradiction after contradiction with Christianity. But there's an interesting statement that he makes on page 19, Axiom 26. Reality is the agreed-upon apparency of existence. Reality is the agreed-upon apparency of existence. The question is, agreed upon by whom? If you're going to have to have agreement upon the apparency of existence, you're never ever going to have unanimity. Because an Indian philosopher will tell you that reality consists in the projections of the mind. A Marxist philosopher will tell you that reality exists only in the dimension of the material. You put the two of them together, and they can have a long palaver from now until the end of the world. And you are never going to reconcile the two positions, because one affirms the absolute reality of the immaterial world, and the other denies it. They will never, ever be reconciled. They are diametric opposites. So reality is not the agreed-upon apparency of existence. Now, Hubbard says many things about the uh, things of the Bible. He quotes the Bible profusely. In fact, he even took the biblical name for God, E-L, and uses that for his first name, L. Ron Hubbard. Instead of L. period, it's E-L, Ron Hubbard. He has a tremendous view of his own message and what he is supposed to do. He has a continuous fixation about his role as a type of Messiah. He maintains that there were auditors in history. The auditors of Scientology had their predecessors. An auditor is one who listens, a person trained to apply Scientology techniques to better the condition of others. That's an auditor. Now, people who have practiced listening or auditing, Jesus, Solomon, Isaiah, of course, you could go right on listing the people who are claimed to be in the tradition of Scientology. One of the most priceless statements, I think, is found on page 33. The less certain the individual on any subject, the less sane he could be said to be upon that subject. The less certain the individual on any subject, the less sane he could be said to be upon that subject. The road to sanity is demonstrably the road to increasing certainty. Think about that for one moment. It's one of the most fascinating statements 
you will ever hear. Now, listen. I am Julius Caesar. With absolute certainty. Now listen. The road to sanity is demonstrably the road to increasing certainty. I would be happy to take you to Bellevue Hospital in New York, to Matawan, to any number of mental institutions in the United States, and introduce you to people who under lie detector tests come out telling the truth when they affirm with breathtaking dogma and total certainty that they are everybody from Jesus Christ to Napoleon Bonaparte. And the certainty is unquestioned. The road to sanity is demonstrably the road to increasing certainty. And they are absolutely insane. It is a very poor methodology for arriving at an absolute system of truth. Now, as we approach Scientology from a biblical standpoint, it's obvious that the Scientology people do not believe in the God of the Bible. They believe in an impersonal God. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is incarnate deity or that faith in him is necessary to salvation. And they believe that man is not a sinner, basically, but that he is basically good. I have before me the creed of the Church of Scientology. And one of the articles of that creed reads, And we of the Church believe that man is basically good. But it is the record of the Scripture that man is not basically good, but that the heart of man is deceitful above everything and incurably sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah warned us of this a long time ago. And we are told in Romans chapter 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 1 tells us all have gone out of the way. All have turned from the truth. The condemnation of God comes upon mankind because men have turned from divine truth and have worshipped the idols of their own creation. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in describing the condition of the heart of man, did not spare us in any way. He said that out of the heart proceeds, and I'm reading from Matthew chapter 15, if you'd like to check the reference, Matthew 15:19. out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. Where do these things come from? Out of the heart. Now, the word heart from the Greek is kardios. That's where we get the word for doctors, cardiologists. But the word kardios is a synonym in New Testament Greek for suke or pneuma, the soul or the spirit. So what Jesus really said is this. Out of the soul... The spiritual nature proceeds evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. And they come from where? From within the soul, out of us, and defile us spiritually. L. Ron Hubbard says, the man... That man is basically good. No. He is basically at war with his creator, alienated from fellowship with God, and terribly in need of the salvation that comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I cannot believe that anyone involved in Scientology can really seriously think that it can be reconciled with the Bible once they put the Bible in proper contrast to these teachings, because the Scripture is diametrically opposed to them. L. Ron Hubbard doesn't believe in eternal punishment, and he certainly doesn't believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the tenets of the Church of Scientology is, and we of the Church believe, that the Spirit can be saved and that the Spirit alone may save or heal the body. No, the Spirit doesn't save and heal the body. The human spirit is incapable of saving and healing the body. It is God's Spirit that saves and heals because it is God alone who is able to forgive sin. And now we come to the crux of Scientology. Scientology, for all its talk about engrams, for all its talk about analyzing people so that they will come clear through auditing, for all of its talk about a new approach to the problem of psychoanalysis, has not dealt with the problem of human sin. It fails to recognize that man is in rebellion against God. And if man is in rebellion against God, if the heart of man is at enmity with God, then it is impossible in treating the mind to penetrate the corruption of the soul. It is necessary that if out of the heart evil proceeds, that the heart or the soul be transformed so that the mind may benefit from that transformation. It is an act of awesome madness to believe that grasping hold of some electrodes, sitting opposite a man, listening to your problems, passing through phases, and supporting L. Ron Hubbard in a style to which he has become accustomed, is the solution to the spiritual, emotional, and mental problems that mankind faces. And it is the height of egocentricity to tell the world that we cannot, any of us, go on pretending all is well, that it all will be well, unless we ourselves are audited. We will die as personal beings. No. Better we should tell the world what Jesus said. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. For where I am going, you cannot come. Christ really gave the answer. He said, you will not come to me that you might have life. If you want to have your psyche put back in proper place, then bring it to the Lord Jesus. He has a long record of healing the soul, the mind, and the body. A great deal more effectively than a million L. Ron Hubbards and all the cultists and occultists that have ever lived. Surely the designer and the creator of the human soul and body is far more equipped to deal with our needs than those who are cursed with the same malady from which we suffer, the awful depravity of human sin. L. Ron Hubbard doesn't need to be audited. L. Ron Hubbard needs to be born again into God's kingdom. And those who are in Scientology need to know Jesus Christ in the forgiveness of sins, in the redemption of the soul, and in a life that is patterned after the image of the Son of God. If we're willing to face that, then it's possible to deal with the real issue of sin. But if we're not willing to face it, we will turn from Christ into all forms of perversion because we have not known the truth. Jesus Christ said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth as it is in Jesus is that God has made it possible for man to really find peace. It's not going to be found with an e-meter. It's not going to be found with Mr. Hubbard and his orgs. It's not going to be found with the double talk of Scientology and Dianetics. It's going to be found at the foot of the cross. And it will be found in the person of the man who, on that cross, 
was the supreme identification with all human frailty and sin. God hath made him to become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made as righteous as God by faith in him. Might I point something out that is also of great importance. A few years ago, I was in New York City during one of the Billy Graham Crusades. And teaching a Bible class, which was then taught on a regular basis by the late Dr. Donald Barnhouse. We had a great number of people come from the crusade to the Bible class. And one of these persons came, and she was a radiant Christian. I had never seen someone just light up like a fluorescent lamp when she entered a room. But she did. And if I'd ever seen somebody that was truly transformed, this woman was it. One night she came up to me and she said, I would like very much, some night, if you don't mind, to give my testimony. I've just been saved at one of Billy Graham's meetings, and I want to tell people what Jesus did for me. I said, well, we'll look into it and see if we can't get it on the program some night. She said, I'll type it out because I've never done anything like this in public. Public, I'm a psychiatric nurse. And she said, I, I'm pretty good in the office, but not in public. I said, all right, type it out. Well, she brought it in and gave it to me. And I read that thing. And if you ever wanted to read something that would stand your hair on end, there it was. She had been through every kind of sin imaginable, this bright, shining person. And she had quite literally been in mental institutions and under psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. She had been the whole route. When I read it, I couldn't believe it was the same person. But one paragraph caught my attention. And in connection with Scientology, which claims some of these things, I think it's most apropos. I'm quoting her now when she said, I had come to the end of the line. There was no other way out but to kill myself. And one night, I went to Madison Square Garden because there really wasn't anything else to do. And there I heard for the really first time in my life that there was somebody that did understand me, could understand what the psychiatrist couldn't understand, could understand what the psychologist couldn't understand. Somebody who cared and I found out that Jesus Christ really loved me. And that night, I went forward and gave myself, body, soul, and mind, broken, shattered, depraved, to him. And she said, he touched me. And it was as if all the pieces of a shattered puzzle scattered all over a floor in a child's playroom suddenly miraculously flew together into its proper place and I saw me for the first time and I saw Jesus and I knew my sins were forgiven and I was alive for all eternity. She got up and read that testimony, and she said, I'm here tonight to tell you, I don't know what words to use except to say, Jesus takes the puzzle of our lives that's scattered all over because of our sins, and he puts it all together brand new. That's what he did for me. Scientology can talk all at once about going clear. Mr. McMaster is not clear. Nobody has ever made it clear in Scientology. The only people who are clear 
are the people who have gone to the foot of the cross and have been touched by the hand of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who could say as only incarnate deity can say, I will be thou whole. We touch him in life's stress, press, and throng, and we are whole again. Our Father, bless thy word. Touch our hearts. Help us to see what Christ can do, that all the cults and occultists have failed to do. They are telling us to reach out beyond but you have told us to draw near to you, and you will draw near to us. Give us the power to reach out in love to these who are seeking help, but not from thee, from the forces of evil. Help us to have compassion and the love of Christ, and to reach forth in his name, because he loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. You're tuned in with the Underground Christian Network.